webinar others and we are so privileged to have you here thank you very much it's my pleasure to be here i uh, always enjoy meeting new people even if it's virtually so can can you hear me okay yes Hadis, uh, i can okay. hear you yeah okay, um, so, so, so i'll, Hadis, I'll share my sharing your screen yes yes i'll um, do that now just a second So can you can you see the screen? Yes, I it is perfectly clear. OK, so this particular presentation is not specifically on UX writing or how to write UX, but it's on the heuristics that we apply when we write UX. But literally, um, they can be applied to to technical writing and other things as well. Not every single one, but many of them. So I'm just going to shift this screen over to the side. I've got three screens on the go here. Okay, so we shall start. Um, can, you put, can you put everyone on mute? Is, is, it, is it possible? Is it possible yeah. to put it? Uh, Hills, you will have to unmute yourself. Muted as well, I see. Okay. So everyone hears me? Good. So good morning, and it's great to be here. A little heads up, during this presentation, I'm going to run a few polls. And if you have questions, please add them to the chat, and we'll address them afterwards. And after this meeting of today, if you have any questions, then feel free to message me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to, talk, to discuss UX writing. So, just a second, it's not advancing for some reason. Is it not moving? No. Um, once stop sharing and then again try. Okay. There always has to be um, a technical issue. Yeah, at times it, there may be some technical glitch. Yeah, I can see it now. Now try to move it. No, not moving. Um, okay, then reduce the presentation mode. Go to the normal mode, please. Okay. Uh, that's a problem, though, because if I want to share the, um, the polls, just to... Uh... Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's moving now. Okay, so hopefully this will work. Okay, yep. so you've heard a little bit about me so far. Um, in terms of my writing experience, I've been a writer for almost 20 years in a number of different industries. And this has given me a very strong background that I feel has supported my move to UX writing. And as was also mentioned, the moment I discovered UX writing, that was it for me. And this is definitely the field that I want to stay in. So now that you've heard a little bit about this side of me, my writing side, I want you to shift your focus. And I now want you to think of me not as Hadass the writer, but as Hadass the app user. And at the same time, you can look at yourselves in the same way. So at my work, I use a number of different work-related apps on a regular basis. So that's my work side. But when I move to my other side, which is a combination of Canada and over 20 years in Israel, uh, we take into account that products need users and we're all unique. And this creates very interesting challenges. So as mentioned, I'm a writer, but I'm also a biker and I'm a hiker and I'm a traveler by chance. I put this picture in some time ago. This is from a family trip to India we made a few years ago. I'm a mingler. I belong to a couple of motorcycle groups, not gangs, groups. I play basketball and I love to read and study. I'm actually taking a number of courses in UX research. So that's just me. And if you consider all of us together, all of us in this group, in, the, in our countries, in the world, just think how challenging it is for one app to try and satisfy all of its users. This is essentially impossible, but they have to make the best effort. 
So if I take one app in particular, yes? Uh, yes, I just, uh, are we uh, allowed to give exclamation mark? <laughs> like, wow, that was amazing. In the side of Heather's. In, in the chat, you can put whatever you want, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see them in the end. Right. I couldn't help saying this, but OK. OK. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Please go ahead. No, no problem. So users, and that's the U in UX, we're the pivotal pieces in what I call the UX puzzle. And apps need to try and suit most, not all, most of their target audience. And we need to consider many different things. So I gave you some snapshots of myself. So this would be professional background, personal interests, life experience, the items that we are familiar with. And this is influenced by our culture, ideas, values, languages, and location. So heuristics are a way to try and find a best fit for our app. So if I take this particular one, by, for example, this is Rever, and it's a motorcycle app. And it's directed towards a global audience of motorcycle riders. And that audience includes people of all riding styles. It could be a, a Harley or it could be a Ducati. All kinds of bikes, genders, ages, and of course, different capabilities when it comes to using apps. So you can see that this is a huge challenge. So now I'm gonna ask you to shift your focus again, and we're no longer the app user but we're the person who is helping to create the app. So as UX professionals, we do need to be careful and we need to understand <clears throat> that our interpretation and understanding, which of course comes from our culture and all of the other things that were listed, <clears throat> of our, <clears throat> sorry, our understanding of words and objects aren't necessarily the same as our users. So in this presentation, I want to give you the framework of sort of what is UX and who's involved in it, and then we'll dive into the heuristics themselves. A natural progression for this is something that we don't have time to address during this uh, presentation, but is to consider Nielsen's heuristics within the context of a case study. So UX, um, as UX team members, we are first and foremost user advocates. We must always put the user first. And as such, we must be generous with our empathy. So before getting into more things, what do we need? We need a product. So Don Norman is said to be the inventor of the term user experience. And essentially what he says is that a product is a set of experiences that need to work together. And it's true, where does a product start? It starts at the discovery level, which here he's written as initial intentions. Then we have the product development, product review stages. Then we get to the UX development and design, which also includes the writing. Then it gets actually into the development phases. And then there are changes that take place after release. So that would be already based on UX research and uh, user input. So what is user experience? And this is a very simple definition I'd like you to keep in mind. So UX is about how we users interact with and experience a product, system, or service. During the course of this presentation, I'll, I'll use the word product, but it can be any of the three. And to put this in other words, it's how we, as we push the buttons or tap on the screens, um, try and get the product to do what it's promised us to do and how it makes us feel as we're doing those steps. So who brings us a product? So we have a whole list of teammates and we rely on each other. And the one that is of interest of us in particular here are the ones that are UX developer, designer, and writer. So the number of people who are doing this is gonna depend on your company size. And there might be people that are wearing more than one hat. For instance, I've even come across product managers who have UX backgrounds who do part of the development of the UX, or at least they're very, very involved in it. Uh, in terms of how a company approaches UX, this depends on their size and also more importantly, their awareness level of how important UX is. 
So if I take, I found two different uh, examples when I was researching this. So booking.com apparently has one writer for every five to six designers, which is a pretty good percentage. I work with, uh, I'm one writer, for instance, who works with maybe 10 to 12 different teams. So this is a heavy workload. Oracle, on the other hand, apparently has one uh, writer for every 100 uh, the developers, which would, which is going to directly influence the quality of the writing. Now, who is our UX developer? First and foremost, user advocate, as I said earlier. They focus on the purpose and the functionality of the product. They consider the quality of the user interaction. So to do this, they're going to check customer and competitor analyses. They're, they'll dive in and completely understand the product structure and strategy. And part of what they do is plan, develop, test, and iterate. And I can't iterate the use of the word iterate enough because it never goes in one go. Then we have the UI designer who must also be a user advocate. And they handle the look and feel, so the artistic elements. So this relates to what the user sees, hears, and feels. So this is brand, graphics, storyline, and also the use of analyses. And on top of that accessibility, because um, you have to take into account, for instance, people that are colorblind. So your use of colors is also a factor. And then you have us, the UX writers. And of course, us more than anyone need to be the user advocates. Um, I would, I, I've written here that we craft user interface texts that help guide the user experience. So craft is not a word that I normally use, but because we're dealing with something very, very specific, we have a certain amount of space. We have a message that we want to uh, convey. We're conveying it to an innumerable number of people. So I do use the word craft because you have to write it, you have to shape it, you might have to shorten it, you might have to put in links because you do need to say more, but you don't have room for it. So one of the things that we have to have is a, this can be an improved mindset. I might carry it a little bit too far that I'll go into a restaurant and strike and want to rewrite their menu, but this is something that, that you have to have. You always want to make it better and clearer. UX is still a developing area. So the more we learn and keep learning, the better it is. And some suggestions for this are to take free online courses, join forums, read articles of which there are endless numbers of them. There are lots of conferences going on. And once you've developed that base of knowledge, you might want to study UX research and design, not because you want to do those things, but just because it gives you a different, better and wider perspective of, uh, of your UX writing. So UX writers come from varied backgrounds and some don't agree, but I feel that we must excel in the language that we write in. We have to have an intimate knowledge and complete control over the language. So the backgrounds that we come from, um, I was a technical communicator. Uh, lots of people come from marketing, copywriting, even journalism. And Another category, I also I have a master's in archaeology, so at the bottom of that pit is me. Um, so you, you never know, it's like archaeology brought me to Israel, brought me to technical communications, and eventually led to uh, UX writing. So all of these things lead us towards our goals, and that is undoubtedly to create and improve customer satisfaction and loyalty, and of course, reach our business goals. So if we have engaged users, this will lead to conversions. And this means that we will keep them or hopefully get them back if for some reason we lost them as a customer at a certain point. And the challenge is ongoing. It never finishes because we have to meet our users' subjective and changing needs as they use a product. And better yet, if we can anticipate their needs, and by this I mean to give them features, that they haven't asked for or possibly even thought that they couldn't live without yet. 
So this again takes us back to our main ingredient, which was empathy. And it should, and it's something that we need to consider at every touch point in the user journey. And this starts with motivation. Why do our users want to use our product? Do they want to go shopping, banking, uh, order tickets for a movie? And then we have to add to this mix their values and views. What emotions and attitudes do they bring with them? Um, we've all heard about the, the lineups uh, outside of an Apple store when the next version of the phone is coming out. So for instance, some people might associate a product with status. Then we have functionality and features. And this is a sense of its practical usefulness. Um, does it give me a positive experience? Is it practical? Is it meaningful? Does it do what I want it to do? And lastly, we have accessibility and aesthetics. So I call this the sense of its aura. Is it uh, useful, easy, enjoyable, efficient? So throughout these stages, we empathize and advocate for the user. We have our own goals, as mentioned earlier, and there are definitely challenges. But we meet these when we evaluate, improve, and as I also mentioned earlier, iterate. And this is to further specify, for instance, during the early stages uh, on the basis of team feedback, then we'll tweak it during the development stages and before release by input from QA, quality insurance, and UX research, what might be applying UX, um, UX heuristics. And then we will improve it. And this comes afterwards when we start getting user feedback and more UX research is done. So now we're going to get into the UX heuristics themselves. So Fred Beecher, who is a senior manager at Best Buy, is said to have discovered UX back in 1988. And what he said is that we need to humanize technology, which I agree with totally. And heuristics are something that help us do that. So what is a heuristic? This is a practical approach to problem solving, which in layman's terms, we call a rule of thumb. They don't dictate, they're not perfect, but they can inspire a solution, but there is no one-time solution because of the ever-changing environment in which we live and our apps are used. And on a side note, if we know these heuristics, then when it comes to a a uh, pleasant discussion where there are different views on the side of the designer or the product manager and you, you can very nicely wave, wave, wave the flag of a heuristic and say, look, on the basis of this heuristic, I really think that we should consider taking another approach. So something that gives you as knowledge is power. So before we get into of Nielsen's heuristics, I want to mention the eight golden rules of Ben Schneiderman. He is um, a computer scientist and professor in the field of HCI, which is human computer interactions. And in 1985, he wrote the eight golden rules, which were later expanded on by Jacob Nielsen. So I'm not going to go into these because they're covered by Nielsen, but I want to give credit where credit is due. So Jacob Nielsen is also from the field of HCI. And what he did is he analyzed 249, I don't know why not 250, but 249 usability issues across many systems. And in 1990, he published in collaboration with Rolf Molich, also giving credit where it's due, uh, on the subject of usability heuristics. In 1994, he then published what became known as the 10 general principles of interaction design. So all of this happened 26, 27 years ago. But these heuristics are a usability inspection technique, which is still valid today. And we apply them to products and features, as mentioned earlier, before, during development, and after a product has been released. Something else that Nielsen came up with later, uh, when websites uh, and apps became more prevalent, something that he calls his home run series, and this is a list of heuristics which are meant to be tailored to specific products, such as a website. And we see it here with uh, often updated minimal download time, unique to the online medium. Usability heuristics um, are, a, are a rule of thumb, and we apply them to features, products, and systems. 
There are 10 guidelines that cover many, many issues, most of the ones that we would normally come across in our day-to-day -day work. They're easy to remember and apply. So then this takes us into design principles. So they're used in conjunction with market research. They guide the design effort of the UX developer and the UI designer. They catch design flaws early in the development stages, and they let us easily identify usability issues. Then as a evaluation criteria, they are used by the UX team, researchers, and usability experts. And at the product, and they're applied at the product stage or after release. This is in terms of UX um, research. And it's not just a checklist because each product has its subtleties. And one of the reasons that heuristics are really popular for UX research is that they're cheap, fast, and popular. So it's it's all about the you in UX research. And the you is the unique user because each and every one of us is unique. And as we mentioned earlier, we need to understand why users want to use our product and give them the best possible experience. So what you see here is a list of Nielsen's heuristics. But what happens when we don't get them right? We leave the users to guess. And if I have to guess, and we've all experienced this, we're confused. How do we fill in that form? We get impatient. We get frustrated. I'm sure more than one of us has been angry at a certain point when it comes to deal, dealing with an app or a form. And then we question the product. And this is the worst possible stage that our app could get to. Because if our users are questioning it, they're not gonna, they don't want to use it. They might uninstall it. And they certainly won't recommend it. But if we offer them, if we apply the heuristics, we can offer them a much better, even great user experience. And that leads to users who are stress-free, happy, engaged, excited. And we mustn't forget that app users apply to all ages, from the very young to our grandmothers. They're confident, they can't put it down, and most importantly, they spread the word. And I'm sure every single one of us has been pre-COVID in a coffee corner where somebody said, have you heard about the new game? Have you heard about the new app? And we will download it and give it a try. So before we continue, I want to mention again that even though I talked about user advocacy, my intention here is not to sound cloyingly customer or user obsessed. But we do need to remember that we have to satisfy our users because they often have many, many other alternative apps that they could turn to. And if they do that, our product won't survive. And we won't achieve our goals, which are customer satisfaction and loyalty, and of course, business success. So now we've gotten to the part about the actual heuristics themselves. And the heuristics are needed and they're useful. Um, before we go further, I want you to keep in mind the things that we've discussed until now. And this is the diversity of app users. Every single one of us listening right now have different needs um, and purposes for using an app. There are the different professions involved in product design and development. The aim that we have, which is to meet and overcome challenges so that we can reach our goals and how to best affect our users because we want them to have a good response. And again, I want you to keep the definition of UX in mind as we go forward, which is about how we, the users, interact with and experience a product, system, or service. So interact and experience. So the first heuristic, um, and Puneet, uh, soon the polls will start. So if you can prepare the first one, and then I'll tell you when to put it up. So the first one is visibility of system status. So these initial screens show uh, Jacob Nielsen's definition, which I'm not gonna read, I'll give you my, uh, what I call user-friendly version of it. So the visibility of system status. The system should inform us, the users, about what is going on and how it's handling our input. So in this particular example, we have Twitter, which 
gives us a, a message that is sending the tweet. And then there's also a note that comes along with it. So what does this do? This, is in, this encourages open and continuous communication with the system and it doesn't blindfold the users. So there are some very common ones that we have, all of us on our computers, our phones right now, we see the status of the laptop battery. Or when we get an email and the envelope is closed, we know that it's not read. Or when we buy something, we add it to the cart. Or if we're shopping, they'll tell us how many items are left in stock. So these are all things that give us uh, visib visibility of system status. Why do we want to do this? Um, I'll mention here that the reasons vary, but there is, of course, overlap between the 10 heuristics as to why we want to apply them. So first and foremost, our brains are on overload a lot of the time. So we want to reduce the cognitive load. And that means the associated emotions, the negative ones in particular, and guesswork that comes with um, when things are not clear. It gives us control. And if we feel control, we feel confident and reassured. If we're aware of the status, we can either accept what it is or we can change it. For instance, I can plug in my computer because the battery level is getting low. We can make informed decisions, which results in fewer clicks. And we can compel action or encourage use. So for instance, if we're shopping and we see there's one item left in stock, we might want to buy it because we don't want to we don't want to come back five minutes later and see it's gone. Or if you're booking a room, so booking.com will tell you that there are only two rooms left. So these are things that push us to, to perform an action. And it makes us feel that the system is reliable and predictable, and therefore we can trust it. So the two images that were here were ones that had to do with flights. And they were telling us when the flight left, when it would arrive. The first one showed that it was on time, and this one's showing it that there's a delay. So the, the, the status of the flight is very clear to us. Now, how do we go about doing this? We offer clear, concise, and contextual feedback. And this can take two forms. There's persistent, which is something like the battery or your Wi-Fi status. Or there's responsive, which can be success or fail messages. Uh, we often see that uh, toast message. It's called a toast because it pops up like toast from a toaster that will say your changes were saved successfully. So we see it, we read it, and then we go on. We give our text in the user language, not developer language, but the language that is familiar to the person using the app. The information is visible when it's needed. There's a reasonable response and action time. I'll explain why the goldfish is there. Apparently, I don't know this for a fact, but they say that there's been a study. So smartphones have actually made us dumber. Apparently our attention span of humans was once something in the range of 12 seconds and it's now dropped to eight seconds. Whereas a goldfish's attention span, and I have no idea how you would test this, is at nine seconds. So when it comes to feedback, if it's 0.1 seconds, it's instantaneous and we don't need to tell the user anything is happening. If it's one second, we notice the delay, but it doesn't interfere. If it's 10 seconds, then that we've reached the limit for user focus. And this is if we're using animation. And if it's more than 10 seconds, the user will probably want to do something else and we'll need to give them another indicator in the form of a loading bar that indicates time. So for frequent minor actions, you'll give a basic response. For infrequent but major actions, you'll give a detailed response. <clears throat> and different ways to do this are signs and signals. A grayed out save button would mean that you haven't made changes on a page. Whereas a blue one would mean that you've made changes and you can now save them or we have notification toast, those messages that I mentioned that pop up and disappear. That might be a warning, an error message, a success or failure message. Then we have what are called reassurance displays and this fits in with the, um, the time period. So if something's being loaded, you wanna give a progress bar or a percentage, or it could be a moving action just so that the user knows that something's happening even if they can't see it or time, or it could be, as in the bottom example, it could be a combination of all of these things. 
And then we have indicators such as typography. And this is when the text is <clears throat> different sizes are used or bold or, or italics. Then we have icons. So in this case, the icons are clearly telling us that it's left aligned or right aligned or centered. Or we have animations, different things that are keeping us involved and showing us what's happening with the system. So we've come to our first poll. And Kunit, if you can put um, the poll up in the, the chat, but don't answer it yet. So in this particular case, you've edited some text in, a, in the system. You've changed the, the script language. So I want you to tell me after you see this, if you're satisfied with how the system updated you. So watch, and I'm, as a warning, watch really, really carefully. So it's saving it. Okay, so I want you to, I want you to vote and tell me if you think that this, there was very, very good um, visibility of system status in here. So that's a yes or a no. I'll play it again, just in case, because it's very easy to miss. Save. Okay, so a number of people have responded. One person was generous, because in my case, I feel it's a blink and you'll miss it. It could be so much better. So this, the what I showed you on the previous screen is what you see uh, marked off in red on this screen. So there's a large screen and the um, save successfully lasted for at most a second. And it was at the very bottom of the screen. So in this case, there are several factors. The CTA is always blue, so you don't know if you've, um, like for instance, your mind's on something else, so you don't remember if you change the text or not, so you have to keep clicking. And I've done that more than once. And the success notification is very low on the screen and super fast. The toast should last for at least four seconds. So now we'll go on to the next heuristic, which is the match between the system and the real world. So what does this mean? The system should speak the user's language. And they should be using words, phrases, and concepts that are familiar to the user, and definitely not developer terms and designs. And this is particularly true when it comes to error messages. So what we're doing here is we want to apply user mental models. So in these two images, either one is okay. Frequently asked questions is a common term, but if it was something like common questions or how can we help, this is more how the user would speak. Why is this important? Uh, it keeps us grounded. We, we don't have to learn something new for this particular situation. It encourages use. It uh, reduces our cognitive load. And this is something that's going to appear again and again. We have, it's easy to understand. So this gives us confidence and we make informed decisions, fewer clicks. So in this particular image, there are two different things here that are not okay. Um, start search is in an active blue button, and that's not normal. We normally expect to see a magnifying glass. And it said shut down. So shut down is very clear. It's gonna shut down the system or shut down something. Whereas in this particular instance, what they meant was close. Um, and, in th and this one, this is, uh, from a coffee site called Nespresso. So essentially, they just want me to go to checkout. And what they've written is proceed to delivery setup, which whenever I see the word setup, I'm thinking, OK, ouch, this is going to take time. And it's probably not going to be a really fun process. Whereas if I order coffee and I want to check out, these are a lot, this is a logical sequence of events. So how do we go about doing this? We use mental models. And that's how the user thinks the product will work based on similar real life examples. Uh, we use familiar, familiar language and task suited terminology, which can also improve the, um, the SEO. Um, and we use understandable abbreviations and icons. Again, everything's related to the user's real world situation. We apply a natural and logical sequence of events. And 
uh, and this minimizes mental mapping. And this is um, not just your understanding of the product, but where it's taking you. And the flow, we, we know that there's a given beginning, there are actions we need to perform, and there's an end. So when it comes to your cognitive load, if we offer a range of, uh, or a sample inputs, like for instance, we do a search and it gives us a number of options, or we click on a drop down and it gives us different choices. So we're reducing the load of things that we have to remember. If you use generic actions throughout uh, a product or a product suite, that we don't have to relearn them. There's no need to recollect um, what it meant here and what it meant there. <clears throat> and if we and we need to leave the information visible, but only until it's not needed anymore. So this particular example, it might be a little bit old, but um, the CD player on your computer. So it's basically the version of what was once on your radio. Um, the terminology used, artist, title, track, the abbreviations and words that are chosen are the icons for play, pause, stop, and for minutes. Um, something else that's uh, an example of a logical flow of actions is if we go to an ATM machine, uh, a, a cash withdrawal machine. So it's going to ask us to follow a certain process. We're gonna put in our password, it will tell us, we'll choose an action that we want to do, and then we'll follow the steps in order to say deposit money or, or more often than usual, we'll withdraw money. So some examples of some mental models are used in the system world that match our real world are compass and calculator apps, design components such as folders, toggles, locks, or trash cans, and different terminology will say trash, wallet, bookmark, or shopping cart. So, Ponit, you can put up the next poll, but again, don't answer it yet. So, say that you have to make a payment using an app. Uh, my question here is, would you be comfortable with the design and text of this particular app? So, don't take into account the speed with which it's um, showing you the information, but that's you're in a form and it wants you to fill in your name, your card number, the expiry date, and the security code on the back. Do you think this app is um, useful and effective in telling you how to, go, how to go forward? So please put in your votes. Let's see, we're at 50-50 right now. Okay, the yeses are taking the lead. Okay, the yeses seem to have taken the lead. So yes, uh, I feel that this is as like in real life. I have a card, which is show, what, what I have in my hand that um, is asking me to fill in information that I'm very familiar with. So there are clearly marked fields for entering information. Heuristic number three deals with user control and freedom. So, it's easy for us to make a slip or a mistake and unintentionally choose the wrong system function. So to clarify, a slip would fall into the category of lack of attention or focus when we're performing a familiar action, uh, like a click error. And I'm, and I'm sure that every single one of us has done this, that we've gone into Word or Windows, sorry, and we want to rename a file. And what do we end up doing? We delete it because the two, the two lines are right, right beside each other, which is something malicious that a developer put in, I'm sure. Or there's a capture of error. This is a common activity that ends up taking over from an intended one. Our brain goes into overdrive. Or there's unconscious actions that might fall into the area of a, of a click error in that our, we get sidetracked and we do something else that would fit the thing that we got sidetracked on. Mistakes, on the other hand, are because the system didn't understand how we were going to think, and we didn't understand what the system wanted from us. So our mental model differed from the system. And this is when it's really important to give us, the users, a clearly marked emergency exit. So in the, this particular image, it's um, a file is being uploaded, but it could be that the bar is moving very slowly and I have something else to do. So I have the choice to exit, to exit out and go on to something else. 
So why is it important? Again, it removes, it removes cognitive, uh, reduces cognitive load. It gives us confidence and it encourages exploration because if we know if we can get out of a situation, then we're more, more willing to click on things and try different options. It supports the users by letting them make informed decisions. It gives us the freedom, super important, to leave an unwanted state and the ability to fix a slip or mistake. So in this particular case, um, Skype is, as, is talking about a rejected file. So are you sure you want to cancel? If you cancel now, you will not receive this file. So it's giving us an option of something to do. The text is not good because they're using the word reject, they're using the word cancel. So there's a bit of a conflict. It's better to keep the same uh, terminology throughout. How do we do this? Through the consistent support of things like undo, redo, and cancel exit. And support interruption of long lasting events, such as uploads and downloads. And in terms of the first bullet, this would need to apply to a single action or a group of actions. For instance, Word will let us do undo, 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 undo. Uh, and also for data entries, and this is the interrupting an upload or a download. So different strategies that can be applied include back arrows, a universal undo, ending a program, shortcuts, and reasons why we would want to do this. For instance, um, it could be that uh, you've deleted a file, but in five minutes, you actually have to present it in a meeting. So your, your control here is that you can simply go into trash and recover the deleted item. Or for instance, you uh, made a post on your company's social media site. And then as you're reviewing your text that you're presenting to everyone, you discover that you've made a grammatical or a spelling error. And as a writer, this is not something you want to do. So you can go in and uh, fix it. Something that often happens maybe in other countries, but I find it happens a lot in Israel, is that people will send me massages as opposed to messages. So poll number three, in this particular one, I'm moving emails from my inbox into a folder that I've called the test folder. So I'd like to get your opinion if you think yes or no. It was clear how to go about moving or unmoving the emails or adding and removing labels. So Panit, you can put up the poll. So I'm opening up my inbox, or I'm sorry, I'm sorting by the inbox. And I'm looking for a particular uh, series of emails. So I've got them. So they're already labeled for the inbox. Okay, I've marked one and it didn't change the icons. I've marked them all. So now I'm checking out the different options across the top and I'm not finding what I'm looking for, which is move in general to other folders. So I'm not finding it anywhere. Uh, this is this a video? It's a uh, video is not running in case. Uh, uh, it's not running. It's, did you see the other ones? Not visible. Uh, we can just okay. see the screen. And were you able to see the other ones that I did moving? No, people are responding. They're not able to see the video. They're able to see mm -hmm. this. Okay. Currently stuck on 03 how persistent support of undo, redo, edit, sorry, uh, end, cancel, exit. That's where it is right now. The previous ones were visible. The previous ones were visible? Okay. Yeah. Or maybe I'll uh, see if we can do this. And when it's in this state, can you okay, tell me now if you, uh, can you see it moving now? No. No, okay. Some, for, some reason, for some reason, this one's not working. So I'll. Uh, sorry, can you, can you go on mute? I need, I need everyone. I need everyone. Thank you. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll describe it to you then if you can't see it, is that essentially I'm trying to 
move emails from one folder to another. And they're all starting off with an inbox label. And what I want to do is move them to a test. So I'm looking for an icon that will let me move them all and I can't find it. And when I remove the, uh, when I do move them into the HS folder, it takes the inbox label with it. So instead of cleaning up my inbox, I now have the same email in two different locations. And the only way that I can remove the inbox label at this point is to go into the A test folder and actually click on each email and X out the inbox label. So this is obviously not a practical way to go about this. Uh, I'm so, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Is, is the yes. screen still frozen? Because are you showing something else? We're not able to see. You can't see anything? No, no, what I'm what, I, what we can see is the user control and freedom that's zero three and how consistent uh, support of undo redo and cancel exit with the three mobile uh, screens that are visible out there nothing after that so do you see a screen that says don't label me no it, there was uh, a screen which had three mobile uh, phone uh, screens uh, displayed uh, right okay, it's, the so same stuck there. From, it's the same screen where you were trying to play video we are stuck at oh. that okay so what i'm gonna i'm gonna unshare and share yeah, again let's try that Uh, the the screen that was there before you just started the poll. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, now it's visible. Just a second, I'm just going to. So this is the screen that you that I lost you on. That's right. Okay, so let's see what happens now. I, I won't repeat the text because you'll get a copy of this anyway. So the different strategies, I'll show the screen since you didn't see it before. Please let me know anytime that um, that's visible. Yeah, okay. visible. Okay, so these are the different strategies that can be applied to um, giving the user control and freedom. Again, I won't repeat what I said before. So this is the example that I wanted to show you. Um, I'll try it again and hopefully it won't uh, freeze. Can you see it moving? Yes. Okay. So, I, so I'm trying to move folders from my inbox to an A test uh, folder. And I want you to look at it and consider whether or not you feel it's clear or not. Just for you to see. You still see it moving? Yes. Puneet, can you see the, the... No, it is moving. Okay. So I'm trying to see how I sorted these in my inbox and they've been pre-labeled, which I didn't ask for. And I'm trying to see how to move them easily into the A test because often when I go into Gmail, it will show me a folder that will let me choose to move them to an existing folder. So I'm looking here, there, and everywhere for this. I'm afraid I'm giving too many hints about whether or not this is um, whether or not this is uh, a good example or not. So keep voting if you haven't yet. So. Move to, and I'm also looking at existing folders I have, and I'm not finding an option. So in the end, I'm Xing out the inbox label, which is not the way to go, because if I had 100 emails in this uh, folder, I'm certainly not going to go through every one. So you get the idea. So. Surprisingly, we have a 50-50 match at the moment. I don't feel that this is intuitive, and I feel that the control and freedom is limited because I'm. one of the things I've mentioned before is to reduce the number of clicks, and I was clicking right, left, and center trying to figure out how to do these things. So it does give me some control in that it will mark uh, emails as read and unread, and it lets me add and remove labels, except the inbox label wasn't easy to remove. And there is a, a toast notification that appears at the bottom, which gives me a few seconds in order to undo 
whatever action I've taken. On the other hand, it auto labeled the uh, some of the emails with inbox and it wasn't easily removable. And the move option appears sometimes and not others. And I ended up having to manually move things. Um, after, uh, and then at, the end, at, the, at the end of the day, I had emails in two different locations, which was not what I was aiming for. So our next heuristic is consistency and standards. So we need to know that the words, situations, commands, or actions have the same meaning. And this is regardless of where they appear in the product or the product suite, because oftentimes we have a series of products. And this consistency contributes to usability. So I jokingly say that the flights, um, this is from Google, Google Travel, and there are two different, there are a number of pages, but one is flights and one is hotels. So in this particular case, um, the flights page, I jokingly say was, was created by the Israeli team because in Hebrew, we write from right to left. So you can see that everything here is right aligned. Whereas on the hotel page, which is just another page in this website, everything is left aligned. So there's already an inconsistency that we're seeing here. So why is this important? Again, cognitive load. We wanna, we wanna put as little pressure as possible on our brains. If we understand, it gives us confidence. We can make informed decisions. If it's predictable, it's learnable. And if it's learnable, it's efficient because therefore I'm doing fewer clicks and I intuitively am understanding what's happening. So if we look here, I'm, this, is, these are the, this is the calendar for the Google flights and Google hotels. So watch for the red uh, squares. So the reset button on one is at the top and on the next page is at the bottom. The dates, the dates are the dates, but the font sizes are different. The end dates, one is solid blue, one is white, one offers pricing. Um, also, the flight side offers prices on certain days, as well as currency and the length of the trip, which could easily be offered on the hotel side as well. And the done button, same place, different look. So again, this is the same website and undoubtedly two different teams. And of course, at the very top, you see that the, the calendar icon are different colors and the dates are set out differently. So how do we go about doing this? We apply heuristics. Uh, we use our company style guide and the voice and tone branding. And a style guide would, have, would be something that would have uh, eliminated all of the errors we saw on the previous screen. We use industry platform conventions such as um, search. We expect to see search as a magnifying glass or our settings or the cart, we expect to be in the top right-hand corner. Then we have, uh, so here in this example below, you see that one of them has search as the um, magnifying glass at the top. And in the bottom one, they've used a blue active button, which to me looks like a call to action. And something else, the card is in the upper right-hand corner, and that's something that we would expect. Company, um, company standards would be that we would use the same language, icons, widgets, and colors throughout the platform or the product. And we let, us, we let the user apply mental models to everything that's going to happen through the process. That's the tasks the sequence of the task, the actual experience, the language we use, the graphics, and so forth. So now we're ready for the next poll. And I've already given too many hints for this one, but we're going to look at the Google Travel site again. And I want you to vote on whether you feel that there's a consistency or inconsistency between the screens. <laughs> I probably don't even have to show it to you for you to vote, but uh, keep watching. So we have sliders on, um, this is the flight page. So this is the price slider, which is um, when it's not in use, showed us nothing. And only once we started to click on it, we saw things. Now on the hotel page, this is the price slider. I see so far we have only inconsistent responses. 
And then we have the rating slider. So these are, these are three different kinds of sliders. Two are for pricing and one is for rating. So again, you see when it's not touched, it's not showing us information. So the conclusion, and everyone that voted agrees that it's inconsistent. It's what I'm getting. It's different. Probably there are different teams working on it. The hotel pricing slider has a very specific look that even includes a graphic. And the price is in shekels, which is the Israeli currency. And I set the site in dollars. So the flights are showing me in dollars and the hotels are showing me in shekels. The flight slider is quite skeletal. It's not giving you any information until you click on it. So you don't know uh, what this high level end is. And the hotel slider is starting on the left. So we have the hotel slider with buttons on both ends, the flight with one on the right, the hotel slider for ratings at the left, some of them have a CTA, like the call to action of apply or clear. The other one is using an X. So you see that the, we're not getting consistency here. You have to relearn the sliders from one screen to the next. The next heuristic is recognition versus recall. And as I've said numerous times, we want to minimize our memory load. We want to focus on recognition and remove the need for recall. Now, recognition is when we easily recognize a person or object that we're familiar with. Uh, and the memory retrieval doesn't require extra work. So if we, for, for instance, if we, take in, if we consider a system menu, it's listing the things for us. We don't have to remember. Recall, on the other hand, is when we have to drag out that rarely used information, like remind me what your name is or different years and other details. So to recall information requires much more effort. Uh, and a classic example is when we log in and we have to remember, we have to recall our password, username, what email we used for that particular uh, uh, product. So why is it important? Memory likes recognition cues. Uh, humans, uh, the human attention span, the, sorry, the human uh, uh, short-term memory is apparently limited on average to five items, and that's not a lot. Memory doesn't like having to recall. If we can recognize something, it gives us confidence. If it's familiar, it feels intuitive. If it's easy to scan and identify, then the whole process is efficient. And we can make informed decisions with fewer clicks. So all in all, when we have to recall, it's going to raise our stress levels. And this particular image, if we think about Word, if we go into uh, to pick a font, it were shown what the different fonts look like. However, if we go into this part of Word and we want to change the font, we have to recall what that particular font choice looks like, which we're not going to be able to do. So how do we go about doing this? We consolidate page displays. So you, for instance, you see this Mac Finder screen, and it's showing us different folders and different categories of applications, downloads, documents. Uh, so this reduces the amount of window motion frequency. We don't have to pop between windows as much. And we, one of the reasons we might have to do it is because we don't remember what was on pre previous screens. Uh, all the information is needed in one place so that we can make a choice. The visible, we have visible text, objects, actions, and options. So this is obviously going to make the process easier. And we have task relevant information that appears while we explore, but when we don't need it, it goes away. We apply common terms and icons and images. So things that belong to our mental model and our user language. And we apply generic commands throughout the product suite. Um, we're not going to um, state something in a certain way in one place and then make the exact same statement using different words in another place. And we, very important is responsive colors. So if your, CTA, if your action CTAs are blue, don't all of a sudden make them uh, green. Gray is acceptable because that would mean it's inactive. But if you're going to switch between colors, 
the user is going to be confused and have to learn what is happening on that particular page. So for our next poll, I, I decided I'm going to order coffee, but um, can't seem to make up my mind and I keep changing the quantities. So I want you to, cons while you're watching this and the poll can go up, I want you to consider if the option for changing quantities makes us apply, uh, if we can easily recognize it or if we have to apply a recall. So I've got, it says, it says my basket, so another shopping bag, and it says my basket is empty. So I'm going to the basket. There are some preset choices here. So I'm choosing a few. Now I'm going to enter it. I have to click a few times to get it to work. Now I'm adding a quantity. And I'm adjusting the quantities over in the shopping bag. And now I'm going to continue to check out. Now comes the time when I can't make up my mind. So I see that I have the option to delete through an X. Actually, the hover said remove. And I need to understand that I can click on that number and change the quantity. But now that I deleted the one, I, I don't want to just order one type of coffee. So I need to go back to shop. Although in effect, uh, Nespresso has about four different shops on their site, but it's taking me back to the coffee page where I'm now going to add more options. And over here, I'll click the trash can to delete. I'm really having trouble having ordering coffee today. So now uh, I see that most of you agree that the site is demanding recall, and that's true. Nespresso is good in so many ways, but they can do so much better here. For instance, the cards have two names. One is one in one place is called a basket, and another place is called the shopping bag. And on that same place where it's called the shopping bag, they reference the basket. In terms of quantities, on the coffee ordering page, I can choose from the preset one, or I can make a manual addition. In the shopping bag panel, I can use a plus or a minus. And in step one of the checkout, I can go back to the preset or the manual, although showing me it was preset wasn't really clear. And I've highlighted these in yellow because they even wrote the, the names differently. There were two different kinds of delete options. I could or exit out or I could use the trash can. And when it, when it said back to shop, I needed to know that we were talking about the coffee page because I can also go to machines, gifts and accessories. Our next heuristic is flexibility and efficiency of use. This is done through the use of accelerators, which speed up the user interface interactions for knowledge. But of course, we have to kind of cater to the new users as well, because with familiarity and use, we want less interactions and faster navigation, which will essentially make us the more knowledgeable expert users. We need to support new and experienced users. Um, users' needs and expectations will change as they get better. We want to perform our actions quickly, precisely, and reliably. And less, necess less unnecessary actions makes us more efficient. So how do we go about doing this? We declutter the UI, meaning we only show the elements and commands that are relevant to the specific task that we're doing and we streamline, and this creates flexible processes. And examples of streamlining are when we do a search. So we put in a search, so maybe it doesn't find exactly what we want, but it returns several results so that we, can, we have the option of choosing from the list that's offered. And just with a simple Google search will is an example of that. There's also uh, searches that will auto-complete what we're typing, which is also a time saver. So different strategies, include the things that you're seeing here, keyboard and mouse accelerators, which can include abbreviations, commands, completion, menu shortcuts, function keys, the double clicking, menu selections, and so forth. Uh, then you have teach me's. Like for instance, I've recently started using a Mac. I haven't done this yet, but I can program it so that it will respond to the 
uh, PC commands that I'm used to it. So instead of having to use the option key, I can create other things that I'm more familiar with. Or we have split menus that show us our most recent activities at the top or most recent or our popular activities. So we don't have to constantly go through the entire search. So for this poll, um, this is a table of metrics and oh, you're stuck again? Just a second. Uh, yeah, yeah it, is, it looks like uh, zero six, flexibility and efficiency of use. We are at that screen. Do you see declutter the UI? No. We see this uh, zero six, flexibility and efficiency of use. It, the screen is gray. No, oh, okay. something which looks like a keyboard on the left, the image on the left. Ah, uh, but no text. Okay, so, so I lost you at the beginning, so I shall stop sharing again and see if I can reconnect. Okay, do you see support new experienced users? Yes. Okay, so again, I won't repeat the things I've said already, but. Um, um, these are the whys. You heard me, so these are the whys. Just wait. Okay, great. Now that it's not working. Okay, that's not working. Okay, the hows were how do we go about making it more flexible and efficient, which is decluttering the UI and streamlining it and the different strategies. So I mentioned all of these when you couldn't see it, but you can look at the, the presentation later. So now the poll, can you see poll number six? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay, so you can put up the poll. So what we have here is a, is our metric settings and you'll choose them. And that, that, that this is what will appear in a table that you're creating. So as you see this, I want you to tell me if you feel that there is flexibility and efficiency of use. If you feel that the pop-up features clearly guide you into selecting your options. So I'm checking out this drop-down arrow, which didn't really seem to have a, a clear function. This is hiding them. So I'm entering a different, I'm entering a specific choice. I transfer it to the other side. I'm putting it back again. Now I'm selecting. Uh, there's no X, so I have to actually back backspace out of my text. Select all. Okay, that moved everything to the other side. Clear. Okay, moved everything back to the other side. And I did let me go back to my default settings. So do you feel that the pop-up clearly guides you? Okay, I see that the direction is yes, which means you guys... <laughs> much more generous than I am, because my, my response to this was sort of like, what happened? So it's possible to use the individual metrics, but when I did select all and clear, and I clicked on the clear CTA, it actually moved the metrics, all of them from one side to the other, whereas I expected it to highlight possibly with a checkbox that I could then unselect maybe two or three that I didn't want. On top of that, the text arrows and actions were somewhat confusing. The, um, the side arrows for attributions didn't actually, when I clicked on it, didn't actually make a change to the screen. But it did give us a default setting option at the end. So regardless of what we've done with the select alls, we could go back to the original setting. So now we're on heuristic number seven, which is aesthetic and minimalist design. And I came across a statement which I thought was very good, that perfection is achieved not when there is nothing left to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. So I thought that summed it up very beautifully. So your user interface should only contain information that is relevant or often needed, because extra information, which I consider visual noise, competes with the relevant information. So why is this important? because clutter inhibits memory retrieval, the visual noise I mentioned. And, we all, and as we all know, our brains are overworked. We need to give them those then moments. Clear navigation, which results in fewer clicks, which is more efficient. 
essential relevant information only, it becomes very visible. Again, efficiency of use. If there's easy access, we get quick results. So how, how do we go about doing this? We have to consider whether or not it's needed. So you reduce the clutter and hide rarely needed information. And how can we do this? We can use accordions, those drop downs that hide the extra text, tool tips or links. We give it a consistent look and feel. So this goes back to your style guide and branding. We um, put in task related essentials only in terms of text and elements. Graphically cluster related information. So if you have different things on the page that are that work together, so put them together on the page and don't make the user jump around looking for different things. Hide rarely needed information. Again, that's with accordions. Simple navigation and window management, so I don't have to keep popping between windows because I don't remember what was in the previous one. And white space. The more the more white space it is, this applies to anything, technical communication, UI, UX, whatever. It's more readable and legible, and it lets the content show stand out. And lastly, colors. If you use colors in your site, give them a purpose and a meaning and be consistent with them. And I mentioned this before, that blue, say for active buttons, gray for inactive. So for our next poll, I've come back to um, Nespresso, and I want you to decide as you go through this, whether or not at the end of this, you feel zen and relaxed, or if you're feeling exhausted from the amount of information that you've been given. So I'm starting the, um, the clip, I hope you're seeing this. So I've gone to the coffee screen that we saw earlier. So everything, there are colors. I click on the filter option and it is relatively skeletal compared to the other things. Then there's the machines that I can buy, different accessories that are available. And I found that there's overlap between these sites as well. It might be better just to have one link that then had sub subsections and then gifting ideas, which definitely overlaps. The different, the different uh, memberships you can have. If you're a business, recycling information, this is simply information. Store locator, which I'm exhausted. Just I need a cup of coffee just to, to think about reading it. And then contact us, which was actually more of an FAQ stream. So I'm looking at this and I see that um, a few of you are actually quite generous, but most of you like me feel exhausted. So yes, there's eye strain. There's just too much information on every single page. So what you didn't see probably is that there are some beautiful photographs buried inside of there, but most importantly, there's also some essential functions that you're, you're that it, it takes a lot of work to find them. Oops. And, and with this, I want to mention, I, I am studying UX research, and I did some interviews with Nespresso users, and everyone came back to the same thing, that there's just too much information and too much going on, and they have to recall what to do. So think like this, communicate, but don't decorate. So heuristic number eight and nine go together. They both deal with errors. So the first one is error prevention. So careful design prevents problems from happening in the first place. And prevention is far better than the best error message. So for instance, in this image, we see you have to enter a password and it's giving you guidance in terms of what you need to put there. Because many of us, I'm sure, have started to put in a password. And then when we, put, when we click save, we get a message saying that uh, we needed to add a number or a letter or more digits. Why is it important? It, um, stops us from making slips and mistakes. And just to remind you, slips come from a lack of attention or focus, whereas mistakes come about because we didn't understand what the system wanted from us, and the system certainly didn't understand where we were coming from. In this example over at the side, you have forgotten to attach a file. Send anyway, don't send. The use of send in both of them is confusing. Uh, we want to... We don't want to have to search and click until we get out, get out of a problem or solve it. 
if we have to decipher and solve errors, we all know where that leaves us because we're not happy campers anymore. If we have error prevention, it saves time and undoubtedly increases efficiency and usability. Um, and the example that we see now at the bottom says, do you want to save the changes you made on your new file? So this is giving us freedom and flexibility, but then we're left with save and cancel, which would have been enough for me. And then we have don't save, which I presume is the same as cancel, but here you're putting me into a state where I'm unsure. How do we go about doing this? So we need to invest in error prevention and messages. And the best thing to do, if possible, is to de detect, improve, and remove those error-prone conditions when we're building a product, not afterwards. And on top of that, we can add clear, concise text and distinct icons. And we can set constraints and forgiving formatting. So by that, I mean, if there's a field that doesn't accept letters, we build this into the development. Or if there's um, a dropdown, we're limited to the number of things that we can choose. Or if there's a date picker, we know that the range of dates is already preset. We can't go into the past, or maybe we can go into the past, but only up to 30 days. And forgiving formatting is, uh, for instance, we put in a phone number that includes our country code and so forth. So this becomes a very long number. And if we can put in dashes, it helps us uh, see the numbers more clearly. And then the system can just scrub them afterwards. So it's, it's doing us a favor. Uh, if we use widgets that have the latest parameters, and um, I'm just looking at, I'm, uh, looking at the comments just to make sure that everyone can see what I'm, I'm showing you. Um, and if we provide warning and confirmation messages, which I showed you some not very good examples of them, and default settings so that we can always undo anything that we've done as in the, is the metrics table I showed you. And search, so the search would, maybe we don't find exactly what we want, but if it's contextual, it can give us similar or common content. So the next thing to do with errors, you got to skip a poll this time, is to help users with errors, to help them recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. And this is really crucial to your product because if anything's going to upset a user, it's to, be, it's to get an error and not know what to do with it. So um, it can be a, a user-generated error or it can be a system error. And what we need to do is make the very best of what is a bad situation, but one that most certainly cannot always be avoided no matter how hard we try. And the most important thing is, that we have to give the users a solution or information that they can act on. We should never, ever leave them hanging. So why? Because that bump in the road, if we give them the right information, will be an experience, not the best, but they'll get over it. But it could be the end of the road if it's a, if it's a really poor user experience that repeats itself. So we want to reduce their cognitive load. We want that they won't suffer the, the something with long trauma. We want to write it in a language that's understandable to them and not to the developers. We want to give them indications and guidance that let them move forward. And we want to let them make informed decisions, which requires fewer clicks. So the dev example I've given here is the operation couldn't be completed. Okay. But then we have mock error 308 server guide. So all of a sudden this becomes a tragic event. Or this happened to me not so long ago. I was in my Android phone contacts. All of a sudden I got, unfortunately contacts have stopped. So it's leaving me with the, okay, I have no choice but to click okay. But they might've reassured me by saying that I've, nothing's been damaged. I've only lost the contact I've been putting in now but it, it really left me in a situation where I felt uncomfortable. Or this is something I took from a project I was working on, that these were the existing error messages. To date cannot be later than today. To date cannot be earlier than from date. And as a user, I wouldn't want to be presented with these. So how do we go about doing it? We give informative user-oriented error messages. We 
write in plain, precise user speak that's suited to the task. We're polite. We never blame the user or imply stupidity, which admittedly is the voice and tone or branding of some products, but that's you have to be, you have to know your audience very, very well for something like that. Not advisable. We need to offer corrective and alternative solutions. And this means indicating what the issue is, if we can. Of course, there are situations where we don't want to reveal things about our system, but in general, if we can indicate what the issue is a network error. What caused it because of internet connectivity and a solution, which would be check your internet connection. But if we give them something like method not allowed, we're definitely leaving them hanging. And if all else fails, then we need to direct them to support or a customer success manager or some other um, solution option. So our last uh, category is health and documentation. And then I'll give you a last poll, almost last poll, which will cover all of the heuristics. So health and documentation is something that applies not just to UX, of course, technical writing and our other fields. So it's always best if a product can be used without help, but sometimes help and documentation are needed, but it isn't a replacement for poor design or text. And why is this so? Because we want to reduce the cognitive load and the emotion and guesswork that is associated with it. We're dealing with users of different skill sets and knowledge, and we want to add to the product usability. And further, find answers. We, we want to give them the freedom to find answers without having to open a support ticket, which is far more efficient. And of course, it's, it's also less frustrating as well. So for instance, this, uh, this is a Google travel um, excerpt here, but it actually shows you something that's favorable. Discover the best prices and details and deals for your trip. So it's giving us little boosts of information, despite the fact that so in the UI, we want to use the content and we want the, the information to be actionable and from a user perspective. So it needs to be contextual, and that can be in the form of text, tooltips, hidden text, which is uh, hidden with accordions, or it could be links to the to knowledge base articles if we really have to supply more information and it's not suited to the interface that we have. Uh, and the, inf the information should appear and be easily located. I'm just going to mention also about knowledge base because there is a connection between the two. So it's again, it's the same thing. You need to use a consistent language style approach to content throughout your knowledge base, throughout all of your documentation. And it should be actionable. We should be telling the user what to do. It's not, this is not a place for a conversation. We're telling them to click here, do that. This, this is the result. So the references that we use in the knowledge base need to exactly match what it is in the UI. If we're saying click something, it needs to be exactly the terminology. It should be well-structured, which is concise and then scannable. Concrete, give them concrete task-specific task steps, and this leads to efficiency. Links to related articles, it might be more than one and give them the option possibly to follow articles for updates. Uh, for instance, articles that deal with versions that come out so that they'll, they'll be notified for the next version. So what types of help and documentation are there? It's quite a long list. Uh, onboarding guides, online tours, help center, reference manuals. So in terms of UX, we have online tours, exercises, and demos. And these are things that um, offer basic functionality, sort of getting started. And then you can have cards, which are adapted for experts who maybe just want to check some facts, or another list who wants an overview of capabilities. So our last heuristic poll um, applies, I want you to keep all of them in mind. And Israel does a lot of things really, really well. This wasn't one of them. This is a government site. Possibly they were hoping that COVID would get over, would end faster than it has. So this was something that you needed to, this is something that you could check if you wanted to travel. So I want you to tell me if this, um, if the different things shown in this site get you, would have gotten you any closer to being able to travel out into the wild blue, what I call COVID yonder. 
So I'm going to start it. So I go to current status and I put in a G for green because I read the word green in the introduction. But this is a case where it should have been a drop down if there are only certain choices I can make. The calendar is showing me years and months in the past, whereas my travel logically is something going forward. The labels themselves are not 100% clear. And once I enter or once I make a selection, the label disappears. So I have to remember what was there. So the tags, okay, location, easy enough to get rid of them. Okay, so that was that. So now I want you to vote on this particular one. It's, it's not the last poll that was shown, it's the one above. And tell me what you think. If you think that the different options here get you closer to what you wanted to do, which was travel, a distant memory. So I see that you're all in the right direction. You're pretty much all in the right direction. So we'll go this one by one. Our first one was visibility of system status. So here we have conflicting update references and the frequency of the updates is not clear. So we have updated status, status updates. In terms of match between system and real world, there's no travel oriented language. They talk about red locations. So that is not something that um, is that we would use in our day to day life. <clears throat> In terms of user control and freedom, I wasn't able to, the X didn't work. I had to backspace out of the text and there were no default settings. Consistency and standards. Uh, they talked about green location or green status, which essentially meant location status. And the update references were also conflicting, uh, like used differently. And the calendars were also not how we would expect a calendar to act. In terms of recognition and versus recall, I had to somehow understand that I had to put in green or red into the current status, whereas there should have been a drop down. So they were acting like filters, but they didn't look like filters. Uh, flexibility and efficiency of use. You, um, could, you got location tags and functionalities. So you had those, they were easy enough to get rid of, but the date pickers, for instance, didn't have preset dates, for instance, today, tomorrow, next week. In terms of aesthetic and minimalist design, very little. I mean, it's skeletal, but in terms of real aesthetics, there was a lot of repetitive content. So for instance, there's more than one date reference. So updated and status update. Two different things, not clear what the difference is. We have current status red and a thumb down red. They're both saying the same thing. And something you don't know is that when I click on see guidance, I essentially get the same information that appears if there's information under more information. So this could have really been pared down and the information that appeared under see guidance would have fit onto this screen. Uh, and also the introduction, it's a very long, uh, not friendly language. In terms of error prevention, they needed to use drop down lists and only let us access access active dates, something relevant in the future. And in terms of the date format, uh, it's not 100% sure. For instance, an American would look at this as January, I always have to think about this, January 11th, whereas I look at it as the 1st of November. And in terms of error messages, definitely developers speak invalid text, current status. Not quite sure what that means or what I'm supposed to do with it. And lastly, the help and documentation here falls more into the category of that introductory statement, which uses unclear terms, a bit contradictory, and possibly the use of tooltips would have been better throughout. So to summarize, yes, we've gotten to the end. UX is about how we interact with and experience a product, system, or service. We need to take into account user diversity, the team members that we're working with. We have to understand the challenge of our particular product in its own market and its users. We have to add a lot of empathy and user advocacy. Iterate, and that applies to the design and believe me, it applies to the text as well. 
And we want to reach our goals, which are customer satisfaction and loyalty, and of course, business success. About the heuristics themselves, we had the eight golden rules of Ben Schneiderman, which evolved into the 10 usability heuristics of Jacob Nielsen, which covered rules of thumb, design principles, and evaluation criteria for UX research. So I see some of you have answered already. My last poll was about if you do write UX copy. So I see there's no no's in the group or of those that answered. So that's interesting. And I see that there are a number of people who want to. And lastly, if you're interested in UX writing, um, you can start with a free online UX writing course. There are some mini courses out there. Definitely sign up for some newsletters and, and join some groups and forums. And once you've got your base, you might want to widen your scope with some research and design. On the left-hand side of the screen, I put some links to um, a little mini course. The UX Writing Library, which is the first bullet under resources, is excellent. It gives you access. It has a number of different pages that deal with uh, groups, conferences, and so forth. An excellent resource. And two, diff two recent articles, but if you search in Google, you'll find innumerable articles. So that is that. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Aziz. That was amazing presentation, I think. Uh, people were completely engrossed in it, and the polls were very interesting. Uh, we have a few questions, so shall I go ahead with the question? Please. Okay, so first question was from Amrita. She was asking for some sources of online courses, but I think your last slide has answered that, and we will be sharing this presentation, Amrita, so you can take a note from that. Another question is from Ridula. As a tech writer, is it possible to advise the design team about heuristics, or one has to hold a UX designation? What has been your experience? Um, it's hard for me to say because when I was in technical writing, um, it was a it was a design center, so there was no UX. Um, but I think that if you, I don't see any reason why not. If you come, for instance, we always have to come with our suggestions politely. But if we come with a base of knowledge and we can we can reference something very specifically, I don't see any reason why we can't. Uh, contribute to the product because all you're doing is something good. It's just important. It's just important to frame it in such a way that you're not going to offend the other party because we all we all know that there are sensitivities. Um, hi, Hattis. This is uh, Ridula. So um, my point was like um, I do not hold a formal degree or a diploma or a certificate in UX designing, but I have a sense of it and I have done multiple courses online. So I do not hold the designation of UX, but I have seen multiple instances where our product is very poorly designed. Um, so you know, uh, when I sug give suggestions, then automatically the credibility comes into question. So what is your advice? I mean, should we, what kind of, um, you know, um, qualification one needs to have to be able to be in a position of command, not command, but uh, authority where one can uh, guide the, or rather uh, suggest the changes? I don't think that because UX is relatively new, I don't think it's necessary to hold a degree or a certificate. Okay. But if you're, um, but if you have, if you if you've learned about it yourself and you have the confidence yourself, right? Then and and you bring up a specific heuristic, and even better, and this would reinforce your information, is if you right. found a similar example somewhere else, say in the internet of a similar situation where they made a different approach, because this is, this is what UX designers do. They do research. Um, I work in a company that they'll, they'll go into to, uh, Amazon and Shopify and all sorts of different sites to get ideas and see how they do it, because there's really no need to reinvent the wheel. Okay, so, thanks. So, you, so definitely find an example and okay. use a heuristic and of course, smile. <laughs> <laughs> sure, thank you so much.
Thanks for this. So Ravi has this question. Is it difficult for an organization to make UX guides which can be used across all the products or services for UX designers? Uh, I will say yes, just because it requires a lot of work. So in the company I'm in right now, the UX, we're creating a UX text style guide and the design team is creating a UX components elements style guide where of course there's crossover because there are different elements that include text. But it just, it just, it's hard in the sense that it's time consuming because you're gonna have to, you're going to have to map your your design um uh, you say your design world you're going to have to get examples of all the different forms you've used and pop-ups and toasts and dialogue boxes and then you're going to have to decide that oh it's like my goodness we have three different forms and they all look differently so you're going to have to choose one form and that's what's going to have to go into your style guide and that will be the reference for the whole company so I wouldn't say that it's hard, but it's it's very time consuming. And, and for instance, in the company I'm in now, there's actually one person who's dedicated, primarily dedicated to creating the UX style guide, the component style guide. Sure. And he has one another question. I think that's uh, sums up uh, a summary kind of thing. How does a final UX design approved for a product or service? Is it through Paul among possible users or just product owner? I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part again? Is it through a poll among all possible users or just the product owner? Uh, so, you're, so you're saying like who signs off on the product? I believe so. Okay, How so, so, so it's, 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 never one, it's never one check mark. For instance, when the product is first in discovery stages, you'll have product reviews, and this will be members of your team and, for, for instance, the chief technical officer. They'll discuss the product together, and they'll decide the do's and don'ts and how to proceed. So then we have our UX development stages, where the product is also going through different um, reincarnations as we decide uh, what's possible and what's impossible. Also, in terms of the time frame that we have, and then we'll have a final UX uh, product review, and this is where you're going. This is where it's going to be decided. So the product manager has decided that it's ready for this review, and it's often a serious one that includes major stakeholders. It could be, in our case, the CEO of the company, the chief technical officer, the vice president of product, and they're the ones that will look at it, ask those difficult questions and uh, give you the go ahead or say that, you know, God forbid that there need to be some major changes or a few little tweaks are required here and there. So it's never one, it's in, in a, unless it's a really tiny company, it's never one person. Certainly, it's always a group decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So we have a question which is kind of common. I don't know whether your last slide of references covered that. I'm just uh, uh, entering the question. So Julie asks, could you please recommend us good books on heuristics? And Alpna asks, can you recommend some free online courses? So there is a free online course listed there. In terms of books, um, I didn't list them there. There are two that come to mind that I can't give you the exact names. I have them in my library, but what I can do is I can. Um, you can share, anybody, share with the group. I, I can share it with the group. Yeah. I'm not quite sure how to share it with the group, but I can send it to you, for instance. Yeah, sure. Or actually, if I, if I join the UX writing uh, WhatsApp group, I can yeah. post it as well. That would be that would be that would be great. Okay. Um, okay, and we have one last question. From Sadhna, how important is it to understand UX design building process like wireframing and prototyping to be a UX writer? I think it's really important uh, and it's it's really, really good if you have a good relationship with your UX designers, developers. They, they go by a number of different names so that they involve you early in the process because you're coming with your experience as well and you've and you've just and you've worked on other designs. 
So for instance, I, I potentially work with 15 different designers at my company. So they're all coming from their own experience. So the earlier I get into the stage, I might be able to stop them from taking a certain process that I know already works somewhere else. So if you don't have to be a designer, but you should understand what the importance of wireframing and prototyping are. Great. So thank you so much, Ellis. Those questions we had, and I think it's a pretty long, exhaustive session for you also. <laughs> Actually, I'm about to go into a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat>